people are critically speaking out there. And for me, it says that if people are beginning to reflect, it's positive because they are the people who need to bring NC leaders to task. I can say what I say, you know, sunrise up to sunset, but the reality is that if the core voters of the ANC are not critically evaluating the party, we are in trouble. And the positive thing is that now I'm seeing the core voters of the ANC beginning to ask critical questions about this party. When you talk as the middle class, you talk as whoever, the NC just dismiss you. But I don't think they can dismiss their core voters now who are in those rural areas. I mean, a young person who wants to go to work and they are being told that, look, the restaurant will not open, there are no lights. That's when you know that the mistakes of the NC are now as real as the force of gravity for the core voters. That's how change is going to happen. Change is not going to happen because we stumbled upon a great leader within the NC. It is going to happen because of the reality of the NC losing power. And that reality will actually be pushed by that awareness by ordinary people. But we still have SA-specific issues, one being ESCOM, the other being the debt and a possible downgrade, and a deteriorating growth outlook. Chris, how do you put this all together and give investors you know, a perspective that they can go into 2020 with? We should pencil in electricity being a binding constraint on growth in South Africa for the next two years. So that's the first problem. Um, the second is the state finds itself in a very tough fiscal position, partly because of bailouts for, for ESCOM and other SOEs, partly because nominal growth has disappointed in South Africa, so tax revenue is disappointed. And the net result of that is that in February, we should pencil in a combination of a tax increase, and however it may come, it may be the fuel levy, it may be at an outside chance, some form of VAT increase, and simultaneously a reduction in planned expenditure. Austerity for South Africa. Now that itself is not good for growth. And, and on austerity, uh, Chris, I mean, you know, when I look at uh, the crisis that we're facing, we, we could achieve a lot by that austerity. It's as if politicians are not really in charge. When, when politicians lack the legitimacy, to actually say to the broader nation that, look, let us all take these austerity measures. Let us all uh, take the pain now so that we can grow the cake later. When they don't have that legitimacy, you are really much in trouble. Despite the global outlook, it would appear that you should be quite negative in South Africa. You've got electricity problems, you've got austerity coming and the possibility of a downgrade. But at the same time, consumers in South Africa have been very cautious, worried about losing a job, for instance. So we've been saving. Credit health in South Africa is the strongest it's been in several years by various measures. Our 10-year bond yield trades at about 9%, inflation sitting at about 4%. There are not many countries in the world that have a gap like that. And so it wouldn't take much to provide a positive surprise for domestic assets. Mark, volatility is on the rise. Geopolitical tensions are escalating. Politics are becoming more important to investments than ever before. How should clients respond to this heightened uh, risk-averse environment? The last quarter of 2018 was a, a really tough time for global markets, where global markets were probably down 15%. But if investors panicked and got out, they would have missed one of the best years of returns for investments. And it's critical that investors don't get caught into standing on the sidelines for too long and perennially not investing and likewise not trying to time you know and, and jump in at times like this when we've had this incredible run we've had an era of globalization which has you know for the last number of decades which has created incredible growth across the globe that is probably coming to an end and deglobalization and protectionist world and trade wars is going to be something we're going to have to face There are probably three to keep a close eye on, at least, but three major ones. Um, the first is the trade war. It's an apex priority, but there is an election coming up in the US and Mr. Trump wants to be re-elected. And presumably as a result, he needs to reduce any risk that there may be to growth. So we should expect a de-escalation along between the US and China over the coming 12 months. The second is inflation. The last few years, we've seen very little sign of inflation pretty much anywhere in the world, South Africa included. 
And that's been very helpful for central banks that have been able to provide stimulus and financial conditions have loosened across the world. The third factor we need to keep a lookout for is manufacturing. 2019 saw a steep decline in manufacturing activity in a number of parts of the world, particularly Germany. And what we've seen of late is that expectations from German manufacturers now are at the highest that they've been in six months. So it looks like things are starting to bottom out and improve. And manufacturing activity in China has started to pick up as well. So it seems that we're at the end of that slump and we're starting to improve. And if you put that all together, we've got a trade war de-escalation, inflation remaining low, manufacturing activity picking up. It points to an improving global environment and one that would traditionally be very helpful for emerging markets. So we may well as South Africans be getting stimulus from abroad, given that we don't seem to be able to provide a lot for ourselves. So in China, you've seen a reduction in required reserve ratios. You've seen an increase in bank lending. Uh, credit impulses have been improving. And that traditionally leads to an improvement in growth. And in China, what that means is more construction, more use of steel. So steel prices now are at five month highs. Iron ore prices are at five month highs. It's very helpful for South Africa. We export a lot of iron ore. We import a lot of oil. Oil is remaining contained. Iron ore is doing very well. And we get immediate export benefit. Helps the currency. It helps our exporters. It helps from a tax perspective. It helps in a number of ways. Over the last few years, South African investors have been taking a lot of their assets offshore, benefiting obviously from RAND weakness and the good returns being generated from offshore assets. How do you see this playing out in 2020? Abroad, you've got more than 10,000 investable stocks. In South Africa, we've got just over 100. If you want biotech, you have to go abroad. If you want exposure to Tesla, for instance, you have to go abroad. Amazon, you have to go abroad. So simply from a diversification perspective, there is always an argument for going abroad and finding things that you cannot get in South Africa. For the last five years, you know, you've seen really good returns globally, but from a South African context, you've seen equities and risk assets underperform. We haven't panicked. Funnily enough, you know, the RAND has been fairly resilient through this process, you know, and we speak a lot about it, but you take the, the RAND over the last five years, it has not been a, a RAND weakness issue that has actually affected our, our clients. It's more, more been a factor of the lack of growth in the South African investment environment. So this has been a constant, you know, strategy of ours to internationalize our clients' portfolios, to, to, to you know, to broaden their opportunity set, to give them exposure to economies which are growing at a far stronger rate than, 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 than South Africa. If you had to summarize your views for investors for 2020, what would that be? I think it's going to be a tougher environment for investors, particularly globally. For high net worth investors, it's important to look at other asset classes, so maybe some alternative asset classes, some less liquid investments that will generate returns that are diversified and have a different profile to the traditional investors. Whilst I think it's critical to, as I said before, to stay the course with regard to your investment plan and investment strategy, I think it's also going to be critical to be nimble in terms of when there are opportunities. I think South Africa is an interesting space, as, as, as Chris and Ralph alluded to, and, and I'm, I'm hopeful and optimistic that we see some positive developments in the coming in the coming quarter. Let's hope we get some of the tailwinds, you know, from the global mac macro position to be able to drive some of the returns and give SA investors. Uh, a decent return for the first time in a number of years. Thank you.